welcome to my talk on uh, turning toys into toy bots. So uh, I'm Leo White, as it you know, says there. I'm on Twitter there. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, someone put together a Toy Wars related conference in Cambridge. Basically, a day full of talks. I was I vaguely offered to do one, and then was chased up to do one. <laughs> so this is my talk from then. From then, so it's uh, still fairly recent. Um, so basically, so ever since the Raspberry Pi came out, uh, came out, I've been using the you know the small credit card computer to convert toys into various uh, empowered toys. Uh, so from the basics, where it's just a radio control car equivalent, to adding a bit more functionality and. Um, smarts to it. So during that time I've obviously come across a lot of things that you should do and a few things that you shouldn't do, you should avoid doing. So that's mostly what this talk is about. So there's lots of information on the internet as well as various books you can buy about how to use a Raspberry Pi to make a robot. Uh, so I'm not going to go over that into too much detail myself. This is mostly, uh, what do that door close, but this is mostly to do with uh, the specifics of toys. Um, let's move on. So my first toy conversion was a toy conversion was a big track toy. So this was a toy that I'd had, uh, had and then broken as a uh, as a child. Um, so it'd been re-released back in about 2010, and I thought, well, you know, nostalgia. I'd like to get one of those, but what would I do with it? So kept looking at it. Kept saying no, no, a bit expensive. Uh, and then a few years later, the Raspberry Pi came out. And I thought, okay, small computer, toy, but I've now got my reason to buy the big track. <laughs> Plus, by then, it'd been reduced to about £10. So that was a much, much nicer, uh, cheaper payment. And basically, uh, I dismantled the toy, put in a Raspberry Pi. Um, back then, obviously, the market was very non-existent for the Raspberry Pi, so I had to put together my own um, motor driver board. Um, but I got it up and run in, and I did a step-by-step uh, -step guide on my website, and that eventually got turned into a <coughs> magazine article. So I was asked to um, uh, put together an article for the Linux user magazine, and um, technically, you can still actually buy that article. So um, it's a bit modified now, but you can have, still go in the shops and buy a magazine that's got a really ancient, out-of-date guide in it of how to build a big truck toy. And the one that's on the cover is the one that I've got outside just there. Uh, later on, I upgraded it with the Ion Rocket that came with the big track, and uh, again, that was a, a second follow-up article, uh, and then I moved on to other things. Uh, one of the other things was adding a robot arm. So this one was one that was available from Maplins. It was a kit you built yourself, so it wasn't too expensive. And with uh, help from a hacksaw, I was able to squeeze that inside, extend the strip so you could drive around uh, with the robot arm. So a few years later, this gets tricky because I can't actually see what's on the screen very well. Uh, a few years later, um, there was this event called Pi Wars. So it was a small robotics um, competition that was uh, the brainchild of uh, Mike and Tim uh, up in Cambridge. And the idea of that was to mostly to encourage uh, schools, kids, clubs to get into robotics, electronics, that sort of thing. Um, so I didn't make it into the initial um, set of tickets, uh, but I was in as a reserve and uh, someone pulled out, so I got pulled up as a reserve. So quite recently, I've gotten this big six-wheeled robot chassis, because back then the max size was about an A3 size, and I thought, well, it's not very fun, is it? Um, so I got this Playmobil pirate ship off of eBay, chopped the middle out so that it fit the uh, size restrictions, slapped it on there, uh, put on some lights, and a few other things, and uh, yeah, entered that. And I did quite well for the manual driven ones. Um, now, this was the first event, so the rules were not entirely balanced. So, <laughs> yeah, one of the, uh, one, one of the, the robot on robot event at the time was Sumo. 
and the aim is to push the other robot out of the ring. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this event actually took a little, this round took a little while because I was very, very, very slowly nudging the other robot, going, don't break it, don't break it, don't break it. Um, until, uh, until, uh, yeah, it got that. Uh, and then a bit later after the event, I uh, came back to do a bit more work, added a few uh, uh, sharks with lasers on the front, and added some working cannons in the form of party poppers that you'd put on the side, and a little server would pull the string and the pipe would come out. Uh, a bit later on, in fact, much later on, uh, High Wars 2019, so that's the start of this year. The theme was space to celebrate the 50th year since the Apollo moon landings. And I'd had this Wally toy sat on the shelf for, by this time, probably two years. Um, and it's all right, now's the time to do the conversion. Um, so this is my entry. I'd uh, added him. So I've added the, uh, completely replaced all the motors because the original toy was very limited. Independent controls on the arms and uh, head. And then I added a camera, uh, which is on the front, and a distance sensor sort of hidden underneath so we could take part in the autonomous challenges. Uh, the main issue I had with Wally was getting the tracks moving so the original robot could just go forwards or turn whilst reversing, not what you need for a competition. Uh, and unfortunately, I drew built my own gearboxes and uh, they did fail a couple of times on the day, but whoops, I uh, still need to improve that. Uh, another one from this year is Tommy. So this is a STEM um, tool. Uh, well, I guess a STEM targeted kit. So you buy this as a couple of um, you know, sheets of plastic where you cut out the individual components and build it yourself. Um, this was one where um, I'd seen other people do conversion, and I thought, oh, I'll do the same. And during it, I uh, decided that um, on their one, they'd 3D printed a new head to make sure they had plenty of room. I'd say, yeah, I can squeeze things in there. And quite a little bit, uh, quite a lot of uh, annoying times, uh, quite a bit of frustration. I managed to finally squeeze everything in. Um, so, these are obviously some of the toy conversions that I've done, uh, but why, why do a toy conversion? So uh, there's quite a few sources of inspiration. So as I mentioned earlier, I had a big trouser when I was younger. Uh, that's me, I think. I think certainly that one's me. Uh, so yeah, it could be a toy from your childhood that you found in the attic or in a cupboard somewhere, or at least in my case, uh, one that gets re-released, because that original back big track of Eventually, you drove down the stairs, lost the wheel, and uh, that was that. Um, then maybe you find a toy that's on sale. Um, so, whilst I'd seen Toby had been, or Toby had been converted by other people, uh, I wasn't that willing to spend 25, 30 pounds on it. But 15 pounds? Sure, why not? Um, there's also uh, quite a few toys I picked up from jumble sales or just off auction websites of the Wally's generally came off of eBay over the price. price. Maybe there's still people on there selling Wally for 150 quid. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, again, you may see uh, someone else has done a project, uh, in this case an RTP21, uh, online, and you either, they either have instructions that you want to follow, or it just inspires you to do your own uh, work. Now, once you've got the toy, you've got to get into it. And, um, and that's not always easy, uh, but there's just a few things you've got to go through. If you're lucky, someone has done it before. So before you start dismantling it, have a look around online. Uh, maybe someone's done it before, and you can go learn from their mistakes. Um, if you don't have a guide, have a spare. Uh, if you're lucky, and I've now got six of these, uh, I wanted all the pods. Um, if you're lucky, the, and the toy's cheap enough, maybe pick up a spare, a second one. It enables you to potentially break the first one, be a bit, bit more aggressive with getting it open, and then you can do it properly on the second one. Um, and then basically, take it slow. Don't try and force anything. If something's not coming through um, cleanly, then you know, maybe there's a hidden screw somewhere. There's often ones... Uh, Often ones um, hidden there, 
under, under labels or just in hard to reach places. Maybe there's some glue that you can heat up to loosen or maybe you know, get a knife in there to pull things apart. And uh, as you do pull it apart, take lots of photos because you need to put it back together at the end. So you can take photos, keep the screws organized, because quite often it'll be a case of, uh, m most of the screws will be the same, but one or two will be a little longer, and if you put them back into the wrong hole, it's, it's, it's gonna break it. And uh, you can't glue temporarily, but it's always nice to keep it um, together. And then when you do pull it apart, uh, again, do it slowly, start opening it up, have a look inside, because uh, there could be that there are wires connected from the top to the bottom, uh, in the case of things like walling and stuff, uh, the LEDs and motors, and of course if you yank it apart, uh, they're going to get damaged, so take it slowly, maybe uh, you need to get open a bit and then reach in with some pliers to unplug a few bits. Now, if your robot already has electronics, so both of the, well, the big truck had a decent motor controller, the Wally one a bit more limited, um, should you reuse it or replace it. So in terms of some of the older toys, uh, so this is the big truck 2010 one, uh, the electronics tend, so older or the larger toys, the, ele the electronics tend to be a bit bulkier. There's more room for it, it's older technology, so there's plenty of places that you can connect wires to. Now in terms of the newer ones, like Toby, um, this is a much smaller board, it's all surface mounted components, and this is one I did try to reuse. Uh, and you end up with it looking like this. Um, yeah, it's all surface mounted components, it's all very fine stuff, and it was really frustrating um, getting all the wires in where I needed them to be. Uh, so, so it is possible to reuse them. And again, check online, people may have already worked out what boards do. Um, but certainly for your first easy option, um, replace everything with a new motor board. And these days there are an awful lot available. Um, there's lots of articles telling you about them, what they can and can't do, whether they fit on Pi Zero or a bigger Raspberry Pi and so on. Uh, LEDs and motors. So before you dismantle everything, it's usually a good idea to keep the robot powered up so you can check some of the voltages. What voltage do you need to drive? The LEDs, what current are the motors pulling, so that when you do get your own motor board or your own components, you know how to power them so that you can reuse them. Now, um, uh, and again, this, at this point, this is just general robot building stuff. So there's lots of articles online about how you connect an LED to a Raspberry Pi and obviously about the motor uh, controllers. Uh, and then once you've got the electronics in there, you need to power it. Now, you can, uh, the simplest way often is just to use a USB power pack that you kind of use for charging your mobile phone, uh, use that to power the electronics such as the Raspberry Pi, and then use the original motors, uh, sorry, the original batteries for driving the motors. Uh, so a lot of the motor boards will have, this is where you plug in power just for the motors, so that's generally easy enough to do. Otherwise, if you want to use a single battery, and this is often the case for uh, space, so for Wally, um, everything needed to be powered from a single battery, and um, <coughs> that was like the motor controller that had it most of me. Uh, but yeah, so the hat, so the motor board, uh, or in this case, there's a, um, a little light motion that Pine Roni do, uh, a UBEC, which is big in the RC car world, which basically takes in a lot of voltages and gives you that five volts you need for the Raspberry Pi. Um, or the motor control itself. Um, but the UBEC one, yes, they're, they're quite readily available, but most of them have a choice of five or six volts. Uh, so before you power it up, make sure you've got the five volts selected, otherwise you'll slightly upset the Raspberry Pi, potentially damage it. And basically this will be used, basically you can pull the power from the existing uh, battery to use the UBEC. So that's the UBEC there, uh, and I. And then another solution is to just replace the original battery for something a bit more powerful, the night pads or the light pose. The light pose are uh, especially interesting because they come in a large variety of sizes. You get flat ones, you get square ones, you can probably get round ones. Um, but the downside is, is that they can provide an awful lot of current, um, as in hundreds of amps. 
which you don't want going through you. So this is, tends to be a bit more of an expert, um, bit more of an expert uh, uh, battery. So uh, to begin with, probably the original motors and a, um, uh, a power uh, power pack is the way to go. Now, regardless of how you end up going, a good thing to do is to try and keep it accessible from the original battery controller. Now, a lot of these toys are obviously made for plastic, and generally the screws are self-tapping, and they're usually designed to go in once. Uh, so you don't want to unscrew it too many times. But obviously, in terms of batteries, you're going to be changing those fairly often. So the original battery controller usually will have a metal screw and a metal bolt nut for it to go into, so it is designed to work in several times. Um, so I've done that both for the big track toy, and then for Wally, um, the main battery compartment here is on the back, so I've opened it all up, and the replacement battery just goes straight in there. I'll probably skip the head on that one. Uh, so yes, here's a variety of batteries from very large to quite small. The very large one is what was driving that pirate ship earlier. Originally, I, I've cut it open so that the old batteries aren't there, but basically that can be screwed in and out many times if you need. Uh, making things fit. So you've now opened up the toy and you want to shove a whole bunch more stuff into it. Now this tends to be a fairly iterative process. You want to work out what can fit, uh, try it, see if it actually does fit, um, whether you want a regular Raspberry Pi, a smaller Ray Plus, or an even smaller Pi Zero. Um, but generally the first thing to do is decide what you want the toy to do. If you want it to just be a regular radio control car type thing to just drive around, you just need to fit in the Raspberry Pi, a motor driver, and uh, job's a good one. Um, but once you've decided what you want, you do need to decide uh, how it's going to fit. Yeah. Um, now the... Well, if you've got the components, you can just physically put them in there, that's fine. If you don't have yet purchased stuff, then you can do such things as um, test it fits. Yeah. yeah, you can do such things as um, you're just cutting out bits of cardboard you know, from a serial pack. Most most uh, websites will have dimensions for a lot of these things, so you can just get the dimensions, cut it out in cardboard, just try it out, see where uh, see where it actually fits. Now, don't forget to uh, yeah, that's inside Toby. That's that was a very tight fit. Uh, and then don't forget to also take into account cables, um, because cables take up space. So there I've got some cables feeding underneath as well as up top. Um, and again, there's different types of cables. So uh, I have to switch to using ribbon cable for Toby, or Toby, if I'm saying that wrong, uh, because they're much more flexible. Uh, and then some of the power cables are quite thick and really inflexible, which is a uh, bit of a problem. Now if you can, try and reuse the existing mount holes because I say a lot of this is hard plastic and whilst you can drill in it and put in uh, your own mounts, it's uh, usually you're dependent on glue to hold it together and of course it upsets the finish. So uh, if there's existing mount holes, see if you can reuse them. Um, you may have to uh, make your own like adapters of course because it's highly unlikely that the screws are going to be in the correct place. But again, this could be simpler, just cutting something out in cardboard, um, that just transfers from one to the other. Um, and if you do need to cut out stuff, then you know, in inevitably with these toys, that's going to happen. But um, do it slowly. Uh, cut out as little as you can. You can always cut out more. If you cut out too much, you can't uncut it. Uh, so you might end up with some holes in your uh, uh, robot or in your toy. Um, other ways of uh, points as well is if you have access to a 3D printer, so whether it's your school, your library, or a local major, major space, then that is some of the most flexible ways of doing this because you can print out pretty much any shape. And that's generally what I've used for uh, something for Wally here. Uh, the big truck was just one of the random bits I could get out of Maplin's. Um, so yeah, so this is a 3D printed 
combo battery holder and mount points. So it connects to the, uh, the original mount points there and also exposes some extra ones for the Raspberry Pi. And that just bends in a bit so it just holds the battery in place. Software. So you do need ways to drive it, but at the same time, this just gets you back into it's a regular Raspberry Pi powered robot. So lots of articles about that online, lots of books available. Um, if you're using a specific motor driver, so uh, one from Pi Moroni or uh, elsewhere, then uh, you know, Pi Ball one, often they will have samples. It's like, here's some Python that you can use to control your robot. Failing that, um, I'm quite keen on GPI Zero, uh, a bit of a Python wrapper. So basically, uh, it comes with a lot of built-in types. Uh, there's a class, there's a technically a robot class that you just say, oh, it's connected to these GPI pins, and in five lines of code, your robot's driving around. Um, so that was quite good. And then controllers, again, same as any other robot. Um, you know. Lots, lots of choices out there, lots of articles about that. Myself, the easiest I think is probably a wireless USB game controller, the one that comes with a separate dongle. You just plug that into your Raspberry Pi, job done. <coughs> uh, the second one, the one that I tend to use the most of, is a Bluetooth game controller. <coughs> this is a bit more fiddly to get the initial connection, um, but once you do, uh, it's, it's, um, it's usually pretty reliable especially when there's multiple robots around. So an issue with some of the wireless game controllers is that if you have multiple ones of the same type in the same room, they may end up talking to different robots. <laughs> Whereas most of the Bluetooth ones, because it's a slightly more complicated protocol, uh, they recognize and only talk to who they're supposed to. And this covers a lot of the games controller uh, controllers, so PlayStation 3 and 4, Xbox, Xbox One, those are generally Bluetooth ones, and if you've already got one of those, then you can borrow it for the robot. So you don't have to go out and buy another one, you can just reuse that one, uh, and then switch it back to the game console later on, which of course keeps the cost down. And other ways with smartphones, so you can connect a game by Bluetooth, there's various applications that you can use, there's one called Blue Spot, that so literally just puts a blue spot, on your, blue spot on your phone, and it comes with a library that handles all the communication. So at the other end on your Python code, you say, okay, when someone pushes the top half of the circle drive forward. So that's one that people use a lot of. Okay, so next steps. So does your toy have any extra features? Does it have arms, a head, a gun? Uh, again, those are all the sort of things that you can connect up to the Raspberry Pi and get working. Um, for things like the arms, then things like micro servos are quite useful here. So I said the original Wally had one motor for the heads and the arms, so they just moved through a set pattern. Uh, I managed to replace all of those with three separate servos so that you could control the arms and the heads all separately. LEDs themselves generally can be driven uh, from the Raspberry Pi, but again, you do need to check an article about this. You can't necessarily drive it directly because you might provide too much current to burn out the LEDs. So resistors, make sure the LED only gets enough current that it needs to light up. And then uh, obviously in Wally, I've added an LCD to give additional feedback. Uh, for Wally, it's obviously fitting because I don't have the little battery display on the front. Um, but for the competitions, like the Pyros competitions, uh, it enables you to select the various functions that you're going throughout the day. Um, yeah, for some reason I did manage to burn out one of Wally's eyes. <laughs> Uh, despite uh, despite measuring the current and making sure there was resistors, it was like if I used a bigger resistor, it didn't light up at all. Uh, and these worked for a while, and then one day it's like I can smell something burning, and one of the eyes died. So uh, we need to replace that at some point. Uh, and then I uh, think like small modifications or big modifications. Do you want your robot or your toy to keep looking like a toy? So for Wally, one of the aims for the competition was that I wanted him to look from a distance like a toy, which meant that certain sensors went in places that they could easily be seen, whether it was with the big track, um, yeah, it's really obvious that it's modified, at least this one is. Um, so if you want to do small modifications, you can, uh, keep it safe. Uh, if you want to do larger ones, then, you know, have fun. Um, 
cut holes in the case to expose cameras. I've seen people with you know, big LEDs on the front, the ultrasonic sensors. Um, but yeah, one of, one of the more fun ones is the camera. You can get the Raspberry Pi camera, it's quite small, and then you can get it to wirelessly stream to a TV. Um, basically, you can just drive your robot around the corner and control it remotely. Yeah, that's one of the cameras I've got on the big track. So I could just rotate left and right and broadcast back again. Uh, in terms of sensors, quite common ones are distance sensors, because that enables you to program very simple obstacle avoidance. So you just have your robot drive around the room. Uh, whenever it reaches the wall, it just reverses its turn to go on. Uh, Wally here has a laser distance sensor in, but the much cheaper ones are the ultrasonic ones. Uh, they are quite chunkier though. Uh, but they do enable you to do simple obstacle avoidance. And then uh, for other things, there are specific sensors for line following uh, and various other um, activities. So. And uh, yeah, that's it. So, any questions? Definitely silence. Right, Just a uh, kind of actual building question. When you cut the plastic, do you use a hot knife or? How do you cut the plastic? It varies. For these, these harder plastics, I mostly use a, a Dremel, it's a, a Dremel clone, okay. uh, to cut away. Uh, you want to be careful because as the plastic warms up, it tends to melt, melt. as well. Yeah. Um, one of my other toys uh, used um, you know, a full-on cutting blade and cut through it, and it just welded together on the <laughs> other side of it. So <laughs> ran the blade all the way through, and then it was still connected. <laughs> I go through it again a little slower. Uh, something like a Dremel, a hacksaw, a Stanley knife, it depends on where stuff is. Sure. Uh, so the easiest is usually the Dremel, but sometimes the thing you're wanting to cut is in a location it can't reach, so there may be sort of the Stanley knife, uh, or just pliers, just grab it and cut it. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? What is this blue spot? So blue spot is a uh, application, um, so you should be able to find it. On, on uh, the internet, it basically, literally puts a blue spot on your smartphone, mm -hmm. and it has a uh, a component on the Raspberry Pi that does all the connections, and you can basically configure depending on what you do to it to, to certain tasks. So the easiest one is you know you swipe up, it goes forward, you swipe down, swipe left, right. But people also don't like well if you swipe in a s spiral or if you do something on the top left and stuff. Basically, it enables you to send different commands to the robot with a single interface, and then it can do a variety of different things. And apparently, yeah, the, the basic one is, you know, forwards, backwards, left, right. Um, you can also do, like, rotate in a circle, could fire a gun, or it could turn on the, one of the autonomous functions. So it's just a, a helpful one. Uh, people have also done other apps that enable you to stream the Raspberry Pi camera to your phone, uh, and um, certainly in one of the books, uh, it shows you how to write basically a web page that is hosted from the Raspberry Pi. You load it in your phone, it has the camera feed in it, and then it has some touch controls you can use for driving the robot around. So there's quite a few around. And again, there's, there's plenty of articles and set books that cover some of these things. <laughs> Another one for me. Um, do you ever get into problems with processing all the different things that it needs to do? Um, for things like the sensors and stuff, the, the Pi Zero uh, is generally fine for the job. When you get into the camera processing, it can be a bit more problematic. So you can just about do it on the Pi Zero. Um, but yeah, it can be a bit delayed in its, its actions. Um, I've used, so for what he's using the 3A Plus, so that's got the chunkier, more powerful processor in it, but then the slight, slight, slightly smaller form factor. Um, obviously the Pi 4's out these days, it has a lot more processing power in it. However, in terms of the robots, it also has a higher power drawer as well, so it the battery quicker, it generates a lot more heat. Um, and for a lot of what you're doing, or certainly for a lot of what I'm doing, that extra performance isn't needed. Uh, so for most of these, the Raspberry Pi is set up as a headless um, device, so it doesn't have the desktop on it, it's not running any of that extra software, so it needs lots of processing power for all the other components. Um, so like I said the big truck's running, this particular one's got one of the original Raspberry A's in, and that's even slower than the Pi Zero. Um, so if you're just driving it around, the Pi Zero 
would be more than enough. Streaming video, high zero again would be fine. Processing the images to do some autonomous stuff, that might be more of a push. But using distance sensors or line followers, it's plenty of plenty of forms for that. Do you do any autonomous stuff with it though? I mean, more complicated autonomous stuff. It depends how complicated. So for the high wall stuff, uh, the most complicated one that was autonomous, well, there's, there's getting through a maze. I didn't do very well in that. Um, <laughs> one of the problems there is uh, the distance sensor, I hit it down the bottom so that, again, it wouldn't mess up the appearance. Unfortunately, Wally's got a bit of a wobble. So when he sets off, he tends to do that. And then the sensor spots the floor and goes, oh, I'm close to something, I better stop. Um, the most complicated one I did on the day for Pi Wars is there's a challenge where the robots put in a little box with four different colours in the corners. You have to visit each corner and for bonus marks do it in a certain colour order. Uh, so that's the most complicated one. Uh, basically use the camera to take a picture, go, right, I'm looking for red, can I see red? And then he'd rotate around until he found the red colour, drive to the red colour, uh, use the distance sensor to work out when he got close enough, uh, and then uh, go, right now I need green, we can do that. So that's the most complicated one I did on the day. Uh, the, the most complicated one for next year, I think, uh, is there's one where the, the robot is going to put into, be put into an arena with uh, several barrels, half of them red, half of them green. The red ones have to be taken to the yellow drop zone and the red ones have to be taken to the blue drop zone or whatever the colors are. And uh, yeah, the, the advanced teams have to do that autonomously. <laughs> so you have to program your robot to go and pick up a barrel, avoid all the other barrels as it goes and drops it off in the correct color, then look for the next barrel whilst ignoring the ones it's already put in the collection zone, pick up that and so on. So I feel that's going to be the most complicated one. Um, so I've got till March to work out how I'm going to do that one. But what would you do that? Just write it in Python and with image processing? I'm probably going to do it in Python. Uh, one of the guys uh, who also did, did a talk um, in the uh, PyWars mini conference earlier this month. Um, I think that talk's online. Um, he wrote his own image processing code. So his talk goes ahead over how we do it. He takes a picture. Scales it down, looks at edges, works out where the board is, and then grabs the pixel from the middle to work out what color it is. So he's not using the OpenCV stuff, he's doing all the processing himself. So he's done a talk, um, show you afterwards, figure out afterwards uh, where the link is uh, about how he did that. Um, other people have used, there's a, I think it's called the Pixie camera, but the camera itself has a microcontroller on it and has a variety of tasks in it. So you can um, you tell the camera what you want it to do, and it just tells you the results. Uh, one of the things I have done with Wally, and if he was working, I'd show you, I've got a little purple ball, and he chases the ball. So he looks, uh, takes a picture, uh, this particular ball's purple, finds the purple thing, works out where it is, turns, <coughs> drives towards it, gives it a knock, ball rolls off, or sometimes gets stuck underneath it and he falls over backwards. <laughs> uh, and then he goes and chases it again, so he will chase the ball around the room. So uh, again, you can do um, you know, obviously following colours, uh, and then with some of the stuff you can also do like face recognition and so on and so forth. Uh, although for a robot that's probably less less useful. Uh, but to sound like if you were doing your own um, you know, security system on a door, then you could use face recognition to say, oh, this person's allowed in, or this person's not allowed in. Uh, most of that is done with a line called OpenCV. And there's usually you can do it in Python. Um, that's all there's Python wrappers around it. And again, there's quite a few articles about it. They're not necessarily specific to Raspberry Pis. Um, but generally, what works on one system will, will work on the other. Um, there's quite a few projects around that area. So that's it then. Oh, yeah.